Joining me now is Tommy Robinson, the man who has become really the epicenter of a discussion, not just about due process, but one of the way the media treats the people it determines are its enemies. And the same goes for the state. Tommy Robinson, thanks for your time today. It's fine. Thanks for coming over. So what is happening that has brought me to the United Kingdom? You facing another court hearing for contempt of court it is really it seems a microcosm of a bigger discussion that's going on right now, which is that there's a lot more outrage for people that are talking about issues than there are for the issues themselves. Even if you, I don't know if you've seen, yes, when, when the reporting restrictions were lifted and it come out that 20 of these men have been found guilty, the media run a, few, a couple of stories about that, but then all of them went on full attack against me. So they all used it. They were more talking about Tommy Robinson and how I could have freed these men and I jeopardised the court trial, which is nonsense, which we'll all, I've got a statement that I'll read out in court tomorrow, which um, I've got the transcripts from the court trial. I've got the judge talking to the CPS. I don't know if you've seen them. I've shared parts of them online. The judge talking to CPS saying that nothing I said, even if seen by the jury, could have prejudiced the trial. Now, what we have in this country now is so many of these rape gangs across our country, so many of the court trials, and what they've done in, in all of the previous ones now, they put blanket reporting restrictions, which are too, too, too far. A complete, if you talk about this case, you breach this law. Yeah? Now, what that does then, if the media, instead, if, the, if they didn't have reporting restrictions, every day we'd be hearing what's happened to the girls, we'd be hearing what the men said, we'd be hearing the, the details. Every day you'd have a different headline. But by putting reporting restrictions on them, for the last year, as I said, over 20 men have faced trial in three separate trials. No one's heard a word. And then at the end, when they're found guilty, you get one day's news. So that's what I believe these reporting restrictions are being used for. There's no logical reason for them otherwise. People say it's so that they can have a fair trial. They can still have a fair trial with people being reported of what's happening in the trial. You just don't need to give the verdicts. So that's what this has been about. And I think that what sprung from this was a movement. It was a movement not necessarily about me. When I was put in prison, obviously it was me that was in prison, but I think the Free Tommy movement was more about people feel silenced everywhere. People are seeing this. People are, are witnessing it. They're having their Facebook accounts shut down, their Twitter accounts shut down. They know they can't speak openly at work about their views. They know the media are labelling them. They, all of this has combined into, into what's now a symbol, more of a symbol than anything else. If, if, you, if you replace Muslim gangs with any other group, do you think the same phenomenon happens? It's what, I say, it's what I'm saying in court tomorrow. If 29 white Christian priests were facing charges of raping young children and there was a blanket report restriction, I'd feel exactly the same way. So, it, it, but, but we have a certain protected group in Britain where you're not allowed to talk about them. You're, you, you are deemed straight away, you're, you're slandered, you're attacked, you're generally attacked from everywhere, from the establishment, from the police, from the media, everyone lines up on who can attack you most. And the, the crazy thing is about this is that the media, this in 2018, a British citizen can be taken off the streets. And when I was reporting on that Friday, it was a Friday, Friday morning, I was reporting, every bit of information I was reporting was already in the public domain. Mm -hmm. I was taken off the streets and what has now been judged as a flawed case and unlawful imprisonment, I was put in prison within five hours. Now, that day, the judge, after hearing six weeks' worth of evidence against 10 men who we had 18 witnesses who were children who had been raped and tortured, after hearing all that evidence, he threw me straight in jail. He let them go home. One of them packed their suitcase and is now in Pakistan because they, he, he treated me. And when I've read the transcripts, they acted like I was the danger. I was the risk. And it's all through the words I'm saying. And that's pretty much what I'll say in court tomorrow. It, the prosecution, the state, don't like the truth, the truth about Islam, the truth that has to be looked, just so people understand that in, in these gang grooming convictions, not paedophilia, but in these gang, gang type convictions, 90% of the convictions are Muslim men. 30% are called Muhammad. Yeah? Muslim population of this country is four or 5%. Now we have to look and think 5% committing 90% of these crimes, why? But as soon as you try and ask that question, why? Which if you want to stop it, if you want to prevent it, you have to understand it. Well, and there's undeniably a correlation. I mean, you mentioned the numbers, that's true. But in that live stream in Leeds, you paint not these men as the problem exclusively, but Islam itself. And, and there was one line, and I'm, I'm not quoting it accurately, and, and correct me if I'm paraphrasing it wrong, but you say that, uh, you know, the Islam itself is the problem here, and, and that even moderate, peace-loving Muslims, you say, are not representative of Islam. 
And do you see how something like that could basically prejudice every Muslim person that's ever facing charges? Um, no, no, I don't know. No, because what I'd be saying is, is exactly that Islam does, Islam does sanction sexual slavery. Mohammed had sexual slaves. Even the, the, head of the, the head of the Crown Prosecution Services, Nizir Afsal, who's a, who is a Pakistani Muslim, he's come out and said that the reason these gangs are doing it is because of their misogynistic views, their sexist views, which come from their cultural, religious backgrounds. So I'm, what I'm saying is, under Islam, this is sanctioned, this is allowed, Mohammed allowed it, if at war, when at war. And we have to understand that for the first time in this country, so people get it, if paedophiles usually have to search for another backward, deranged person on, on a chat forum online who they don't know to share their sexual fantasies with. This is brothers, work colleagues. It's like a man going into a whole workplace taxi rank and saying, I've got a 12-year-old girl who wants to share her. Now, any other community, if you'd done that, in the, if a Sikh man went into all of his business friends or his work colleagues and said, who wants to rape this young girl? Those men would probably attack him. They'd certainly report him to the police. Not one case throughout the last 20 or 30 years has any Muslim put forward evidence against these men. In fact, when these men have gone to court, just so we understand as well, the ex-mayor of one of the towns, the Labour Muslim councillor, they went to court not against the men, they went to court and gave character references for them. There's no uproar within the Islamic community, in fact. But this is human corruption you're describing. I mean, does your worldview not exclude the Muslim reformers that, if anything, are trying to fight against the same things you're trying to fight no, of against? No, uh, of course, Muslim reformers, there are many Muslim reformers who speak, speak up about this. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, well, I'm not saying all Muslims are, are at this. What I'm saying is there is a problem within Islamic ideology. If we look at Boko Haram, when they kidnapped 200 girls, the leader of Boko Haram stood, stood on a video and said, Muhammad commands us to do this. Now, what I'm saying is when we see the sexual slavery by ISIS, when they're taking and selling the girls, have these young English girls been taken as sexual slaves? Yes, they have. At an industrial level, across our whole entire country, 1,400 girls just in Rotherham. Now, Rotherham only has a Muslim population of 10,000. Three and a half thousand is the men that fit the age of the groomers. How many men in that community, for 1,400 girls to have been raped, and each of the victims will tell you in their statements how many men raped them, 20 men, 30 men, 40 men. How many men in that community? I'm saying we have to understand how big this problem is. And we also have to understand the mindset. And the reason why I bring it back to Islam is because I've even been on a chat show in Britain, and I've been talking about these young children. And when I watched it back, the Muslim woman wearing a hijab corrects me. She says, young women. And I didn't clock it at the time. But when I watched it back, I, I said children, she said young women. Because under Islam, these are women. Well, as soon as a girl starts her puberty, she's become a woman. So we're viewing these as children, okay? Many of the, the Muslim community are not. They're saying- There are two different dialogues there entirely. Two different meanings to words, two different views completely. And you have to understand how their community are viewing it and how they view women, how they view their own women, but how they view non-Muslim women. And we've, I've seen a Muslim leader has come out today and said the Imams are promoting this. So this is a problem embedded, I, I say across, and, and we've seen the Labour councillors have come out and said, oh, it's, it's an opportunity because of the opportunity, because their taxi drivers come into contact with the young girls. Well, there's no taxi driver ring anywhere in Britain from non-Muslims or Sikhs or Jews or Hindus or anyone that has formed a gang like this and targeted vulnerable children like this, coordinated through the workplace. There's nothing else like it, nothing. So it's not the contact, it's to do with their beliefs, their views of non-Muslims, their views of what's fair game and what's not fair game, their views on, yeah, so, so the whole thing I, I'd say is that, which we should have a national inquiry on, is the link between Islam and these gangs. Tommy Robinson, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. For the True North Initiative, I'm Andrew Lawton.